Tobias Smollett. The Adventures of Roderick Random. Tobias George Smollett was born at Dalkern, Dumbartonshire, Scotland, in 1721. He was apprenticed to a Glasgow apothecary, came to London in 1739. Much in the way described in Roderick Random, with a tragedy in his pocket, and very little else. The play, Regicide, he submitted in vain to various theatrical managers, and, reduced almost to starvation. During the same year accepted the post of surgeon's mate on board a king's ship. In 1746 he returned to England, bent upon another desperate effort to make a living by his pen. A period of adverse fortune followed, broken, however, in 1748 by the publication of The Adventures of Roderick Random. Two years later Smollett obtained his M.D. degree, and for a number of years combined medical work with literature. In 1756 he was made editor of the Critical Review, a post which resulted in a fine of £100 and three months. Imprisonment for a libel on Admiral Knowles. He died on October 21, 1771. Smollett wrote altogether five novels and a number of historical works and records of travel. It is impossible to overestimate his influence on novel writing. Most of the great Victorian writers, especially Charles Dickens, owe much to his art. I, my birth, parentage, and childhood. I was born in the northern part of this United Kingdom. In the house of my grandfather, a gentleman of considerable fortune and influence, who was remarkable for his abilities in the law, which he exercised with great success in the station of a judge. My father, his youngest son, falling in love with a poor relation, who lived with the old gentleman in the quality of housekeeper, espoused her privately, and I was the first fruit of that marriage. On my grandfather telling my father one day, that he had provided a match for him, the latter frankly owned what he had done. He added, that no exception could be taken to his wife's virtue, birth, beauty, and good sense. And as for fortune, it was beneath his care, he could be in no danger of wanting while his father's tenderness remained which he and his wife should always cultivate with the utmost veneration. Your brothers and sisters, said my grandfather, did not think it beneath them to consult me in an affair of such importance as matrimony, neither, I suppose, would you have omitted that piece of duty. Had not you some secret fund in reserve, to the comforts of which I leave you? With a desire that you will this night seek out another habitation for yourself and wife. Sir, you are a polite gentleman. I will send you an account of the expense I have been at in your education. I wish you a great deal of joy, and am your very humble servant. So saying, he left my father in a situation easily imagined. However, he did not long hesitate, for being perfectly well acquainted with my grandfather's disposition. He knew it would be to no purpose to attempt him by prayers and entreaties. So without any further application, he betook himself with his disconsolate bedfellow to a farmhouse, where an old servant of his mother dwelt. In this ill-adapted situation they remained for some time, until my mother, hoping that her tears and condition would move my grandfather to compassion, went, in disguise, to the house, and implored his forgiveness. My grandfather told her that he had already made a vow which put it out of his power to assist her. And this said, he retired. My mother was so afflicted by this that she was, at once, thrown into violent pains. By the friendship of an old maid servant she was carried up to a garret, where I was born. Three days later my grandfather sent a peremptory order to her to be gone, and weakness, grief, and anxiety soon put an end to her life. My father was so affected with her death, that he remained six weeks deprived of his senses. During which time, the people where he lodged carried the infant to the old man, who relented so far as to send the child to nurse. My father's delirium was succeeded by a profound melancholy. At length he disappeared, and could not be heard of. And there were not wanting some who suspected my uncles of being concerned in my father's fate. On the supposition that they would all share in the patrimony destined for him. I grew apace and the jealous enmity of my cousins quickly showed itself. Before I was six years of age their implacable hatred made them blockade my grandfather, so that I never saw him but by stealth. 
I was soon after sent to school at a village hard by, of which my grandfather had been dictator time out of mind, but as he neither paid for my board, nor supplied me with clothes, books, or other necessaries, my condition was very ragged and contemptible, and the schoolmaster gave himself no concern about the progress I made. In spite of all this, I became a good proficient in the Latin tongue, but the contempt which my appearance produced, the continual wants to which I was exposed, and my own haughty disposition, involved me in a thousand troubles and adventures. I was often and humanly scourged for crimes I did not commit. Because having the character of a vagabond in the village every piece of mischief whose author lay unknown, was charged upon me. Far from being subdued by this infernal usage, my indignation triumphed, and the more my years and knowledge increased, the more I perceived the injustice and barbarity of the treatment I received. By the help of our Russia, I made a surprising progress in the classics and arithmetic. So that before I was twelve years old I was allowed by everybody to be the best scholar in the school. Meanwhile, I took the advantage of every play day to present myself before my grandfather to whom I seldom found access, by reason of his being closely beseeched by a numerous family of his grandchildren, who, though they perpetually quarrelled among themselves, never failed to join against me, as the common enemy of all. His heir, who was about the age of eighteen, minded nothing but fox-hunting, and never set eyes on me, without uncoupling his beagles, and hunting me into some cottage or other, whither I generally fled for shelter. About this time, my mother's only brother, who had been long abroad, lieutenant of a man of war, arrived in his own country. Where, being informed of my condition, he came to see me, and, out of his slender finances, not only supplied me with what necessaries I wanted for the present, but resolved not to leave the country until he had prevailed on my grandfather to settle something handsome on me for the future. To this end he set out with me for my grandfather's house and after a few minutes pause he was admitted. When we came into the judge's presence, through a lane of my relations, my uncle, after two or three sebos, expressed himself in this manner, your servant your servant, what cheer! I suppose you don't know me mayhap you don't. My name is Tom Bowling. And this here boy you look as if you did not know him neither, tis like you mayn't. Tis my nephew, do you see? Roderick random your own flesh and blood, and, if you have any conscience at all, do something for this poor boy, who has been used at a very unchristian rate. Come consider, old gentleman, you are going in a short time to give an account of your evil actions. Remember the wrongs you did his father, and make all the satisfaction in your power before it be too late. The least thing you can do is to settle his father's portion on him. The judge in reply told my uncle he had been very kind to the boy, whom he had kept to school seven or eight years. Although he was informed he made no progress in his learning, but was addicted to all manner of vice. However, he would see what the lad was fit for, and bind him apprentice to some honest tradesman or other, provided he would behave for the future as became him. The honest tar answered my grandfather, that it was true he had sent me to school but it had cost him nothing, as to my making small progress, he was well informed as how Rory was the best scholar of his age in all the country. Thank you for your courteous offer of binding the lad apprentice to a tradesman. I suppose you would make a tailor of him, would you? I had rather see him hanged, do you see? Come along, Rory, I perceive how the land lies, my boy, let's tack about if faith, while I have a shilling, thou shan't want a sixpence. Bye old gentleman, you are bound for the other world. But damnably ill provided for the voyage. Thus ended our visit, and we returned to the village. My uncle muttering curses all the way against the old shark and the young fry that surrounded him. Do I arrive in London? A few weeks after our first visit, we were informed that the old judge, conscious of his approaching end, had made his will, and desired to see all his descendants. So my uncle set out with me a second time, and when we entered his chamber we found my grandfather in his last agonies. My uncle approached him with these words. How fare ye, old gentleman! Lord have mercy upon your poor sinful soul. Here's poor Rory come to see you before you die, and receive your blessing. What, man! 
Don't despair you have been a great sinner, tis true. What then? There's a righteous judge above ain't there? Yes, yes, he's a going he minds me no more than a porpoise, the land crabs will have him. I see that his anchor's a peak, i faith. In a few minutes we were convinced of my grandfather's decease. By a dismal yell uttered by the young ladies in his apartment. It was not till after the funeral that the will was read, and the reader can scarce conceive the astonishment and mortification that appeared, when the attorney pronounced aloud. The young squire sole heir of all his grandfather's estate, personal and real, and that there were no legacies. My uncle at once decided, though he could ill afford it, to give me university education, and accordingly settled my board and other expenses at a town not many miles distant, famous for its colleges, whither we repaired in a short time. In a few days after, my uncle set out for his ship. And I began to consider my precarious situation, that my sole dependence was on the generosity of one man. I at once applied myself with great care to my studies, and in the space of three years I understood Greek very well, and was pretty far advanced in mathematics. Then one day my landlady's husband put two letters in my hand, from my uncle. The first was to my landlord, explaining that he had fought a duel with his captain, and in consequence had been obliged to sheer off from his ship. The second was to me, assuring me that all would be well some day. My landlord only shook his head and desired me to provide myself with another lodging. Which I promptly did, and for a time I took service under a drunken surgeon named Crab. When I deemed myself sufficiently master of my business, I decided to go to London. You may easily get on board of a king's ship in quality of a surgeon's mate, said Crab, where you will certainly see a great deal of practice. And stand a good chance of getting prize money. In a few weeks I set out for London, my whole fortune consisting of one suit of clothes. Half a dozen ruffled shirts, as many plain, four pair of stockings, a case of pocket instruments, Wiseman's surgery, and ten guineas in cash. For which crab took my bond. At Newcastle upon Tyne I found an old schoolfellow, named Hughes Trapp. Employed in a barber's shop, and we at once embraced cordially. Strap. Having saved sufficient money for the occasion, at once decided to go to London with me. And we departed next morning by daybreak. As we travelled mostly in wagons, it was a tedious journey, but at length we entered the great city. Nothing but disappointment awaited us. In vain I applied at the Navy office. I had satisfied the board at Surgeon's Hall. It seemed nothing but money could help me at the Navy office and by that time I had not wherewithal to purchase a dinner. Strap obtained employment and generously shared his purse with me, otherwise I should have starved. Instead of getting an appointment as surgeon's mate, I was seized, when I was crossing Tower Wharf, by a press gang, and on my resistance, was disarmed, taken prisoner, and carried on board, where, after being treated like a malefactor, I was thrust down into the hold among a parcel of miserable wretches, the sight of whom well nigh distracted me. After we had sailed, I was released from mines by the good offices of a surgeon's mate whom I had met on land, and subsequently I was appointed to assist the surgeon, and exempted from all other duties. Our destination was the West Indies, and here I saw active service in the war with Spain. When the time came to return to England the ship was wrecked off the coast of Sussex. I got ashore, and in my distress was glad to be hired by an elderly lady as her footman. I speedily acquired the good opinion of my mistress, and fell in love with her niece Nasisa, cursing the servile station that placed me so far beneath the regard of this amiable and adorable being. I soon learned that the brother of my idol was a savage fox-hunting squire, who had designed the lovely Nasisa for Sir Timothy Thicket, a neighboring fox-hunter. I cursed in my heart this man for his presumption, looking upon him as my rival. Eight months I remained in the station of footman, and then an accident put an end to my servitude. I was passing through a wood when I heard the cries of Nasisa, and rushing to her assistance, rescued her from the brutal familiarities of Sir Timothy. I struck his weapon out of his hand, and cudgelled him so that he fell to the ground and lay senseless. Nasisa thanked me with tender acknowledgments, 
but I was soon warned that I should be apprehended and transported for assaulting a magistrate. I escaped to France by the aid of smugglers. But before I left I avowed my passion, and explained that I was an unfortunate gentleman, and the story of my mishandling provoked a sympathetic response. 3. I recover my father. From the Marshall Sea Prison. Where I had been lodged for debt, some time after my return from France. I was rescued by my generous uncle, Mr. Bowling. He told me that he was now in command of a large merchant ship, and proposed that I should sail with him in quality of his surgeon, with a share in the profits. I accepted his offer, without hesitation, and Strap, who had stood by me in so many troubles. At my desire was made ship steward by Captain Bowling. Before we sailed I managed to achieve an interview with Narcissa. And sure, lovers never parted with such sorrow and reluctance as we. Our voyage was entirely successful. And while we were at anchor in that part of South America which is called Buenos Aires, I amused myself with the transporting hopes of enjoying Narcissa on our return. I had money and would marry his sister by stealth if the fox hunting squire was still as averse to me as ever. We were very much caressed by the Spanish gentlemen of the country, and made the acquaintance of a certain English seigneur, who had been settled in those parts many years, and had acquired the love and esteem of the whole province. I had been struck with a profound veneration for this gentleman on first seeing him, when he spoke I listened with reverence and attention. I sympathized involuntarily with the melancholy which saddened the face of Don Rodrigo for so he was named. Don Rodrigo, understanding we were his countrymen, desired our company at his house, and seemed to show a particular regard for me. He made me a present of a beautiful ring, saying at the same time that he was once blessed with a son, who, had he lived, would have been nearly of my age. This observation made my heart throb with violence, and a crowd of confused ideas filled my imagination. My uncle, perceiving my absence of thought, tapped me on the shoulder and said, Odds, are you asleep, Rory? Before I had time to reply, Don Rodrigo said eagerly, Pray, Captain, what is the young gentleman's name? His name, said my uncle, is Roderick Random. Gracious powers! cried Don Rodrigo, starting up and his mother's. His mother, answered the captain, amazed, was called Charlotte Bowling. O oh, bounteous heaven! exclaimed Don Rodrigo, clasping me in his arms. My son! My son! Have I found thee again? So saying, he fell upon my neck and wept aloud for joy. The captain, wringing my father's hand, cried, Brother Random, I'm rejoiced to see you God be praised for this happy meeting. Don Rodrigo embraced him affectionately, saying, Are you my Charlotte's brother? Brother, you are truly welcome. This day is a jubilee. My father decided to return with us to England. And having learnt from me of my love for Nasisa, approved of my passion. And promised to contribute all in his power towards its success. I stayed in his house, and at his request recounted to him the passages of my life. And he gratified me with the particulars of his story. Careless of life, he said, and unable to live in a place where every object recalled the memory of my dear Charlotte. I little suspected that my father's unkindness would have descended to my innocent orphan. When I set out for France, from Paris I accompanied a young nobleman as tutor to the court of Spain, and from Spain I came to South America, where for sixteen years heaven has prospered my undertakings. Your fate I could never learn, notwithstanding all my inquiries. Presently Strapper arrived, whom my father at once took by the hand, saying, Is this the honest man who befriended you so much in your distress? I will soon put it in the power of my son to reward you for your good offices in his behalf. Shortly afterwards, Don Rodrigo, who had already remitted twenty thousand pounds to Holland, settled his affairs, converted his effects into silver and gold, visited and took leave of all his friends, and, coming on board of my uncle's ship, with the first favorable wind we sailed from the Rio de la Plata, and in three months after made the lizard. It is impossible to express the joy I felt at the sight of English ground. Don Rodrigo was not unmoved, and Strap shed tears of gladness.
my father and I went ashore immediately at Portsmouth, leaving Strap with the captain to go round with the ship. I rode across country into Sussex, where I learned that Nassisa was in London, and that her brother was married, and vowed his sister should lose her fortune if she married without his consent. For I am married. No sooner was I in London than I sought my charmer in her lodgings. How was my soul transported, when Nassisa broke in upon my view, in all the bloom of ripened beauty? We flew into each other's arms. O oh, adorable Nassisa, cried I, never shall we part again. In the evening I accompanied my father to her lodgings. He embraced her tenderly, and told her he was proud of having a son who had engaged the affections of such a fine lady. Don Rodrigo was, quickly, as much charmed with her good sense as with her appearance. And she was no less pleased with his understanding and polite address. The following was the squire's answer to a letter from my father. Promising handsome settlements on my marriage to Nassisa. Sir concerning a letter which I received, subscribed at random. This is the answer. As for you, I know nothing of you. Your son, or pretended son, I have seen if he marries my sister, at his peril be it, I do declare, that he shall have not one farthing of her fortune, which becomes my property, if she takes a husband without my consent, your settlement, I do believe, is all a sham, and yourself no better than you should be, but if you had all the wealth of the Indies, your son should never match in our family, with the consent of, or St. No Paul. My father was not much surprised at this polite letter, after having heard the character of the author, and as for me, I was very pleased at his refusal, because I now had an opportunity of showing my disinterested love. I waited on my charmer, and having imparted the contents of her brother's letter, the time of our marriage was fixed at the distance of two days. My uncle being by this time come to town. I introduced him to my bride, and he was struck dumb with admiration at her beauty. After having kissed and gazed at her for some time, he turned to me, saying, Odds bobs, Rory, here's a notable prize, indeed, finely built and gloriously rigged, i faith. No offence. I hope, niece, you must not mind what I say, being, as the saying is, a plain seafaring man. Nassisa received him with great civility, and told him that she looked upon him as her uncle, by which name she begged leave to call him for the future. The honest captain was transported at her courteous behaviour, and insisted upon giving her away at the ceremony, swearing that he loved her as well as if she was his own child. Everything being prepared for the solemnization of our nuptials, which were to be performed privately at my father's house, the auspicious hour arrived. In a little time the clergyman did his office, my uncle, at his own request, acting the part of a father to my dear Nassisa. My father, intending to revisit his native country, Nassisa and I resolved to accompany him, while my uncle determined to try his fortune once more at sea. At Edinburgh, Don Rodrigo, having intelligence that the family estate was to be exposed to sale by public auction, determined to make a purchase, and actually bought all the land that once belonged to his father. In a few days after this bargain was made, we left Edinburgh, in order to go and take possession and, by the way, halted one night in that town where I was educated. Upon inquiry, I found that Mr. Crabbe was dead. Whereupon I sent for his executor, paid the sum I owed, with interest, and took up my bond. We proceeded to our estate, which lay about twenty miles from this place, and were met by a prodigious numbers of poor tenants, men, women, and children, who testified their joy by loud acclamations so that we were almost devoured by their affection. My charming Nassisa was universally admired by all our neighbours who called upon us. And she is so well pleased with the situation of the place, and the company round, that she has not the least desire of changing her habitation. If there be such a thing as true happiness on earth, I enjoy it. End of the story. Thank you.